Our scripture for today is found in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. Hear God's word. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am make, making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magical arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. We thank you, Lord, for this reading of your holy word. Amen. Please be seated. In this chapter of Revelation, we hear some very wonderful things and some very scary things. The most wonderful thing we hear is Jesus' words telling us his name. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And as you can see on the pulpit, that's an Alpha and the Omega. Alpha is the first letter, and Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. But God's not speaking about alphabets here. He's speaking about reality. That God is absolutely the beginning, and he's absolutely the end. Everything ultimately originates in God, and everything will ultimately end with him. Now there's a vital message here that each one of us needs to understand. Jesus says everything begins with him, everything will end in him. He's our creator, and he's the judge of heaven and earth. The judge for our eternal destiny, so it's important that we know him. In the Old Testament, God revealed and said, said this to the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. So everything comes from God. Every, nothing is before God, nothing is after God. That's why God's name is I Am, the eternal I Am. And note how God provides us with a, a redeemer in this, this scripture. And he warns us, beside me there is no God. So those who are looking for God outside of Jesus Christ, who said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, will never find God. Now if you want to know your origin and your destiny, you need to seek the Alpha, the beginning, who made you. If you want to know where you're going after death, you need to know the Omega, who made a way for us to be redeemed. And that's why Jesus said the words, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. What he's telling us, he's in control of everything. And the Bible uses the illustration of a potter. In Jeremiah chapter 18, God says, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as the potter? says the Lord, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand. You know pottery is nothing but dirt until the redeeming hand of the potter shapes its destiny. And that's what Jesus is saying here. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the potter. I shape history. I know where it began. I know where it's, where it's going to end. Jesus said, I'm the Alpha, the beginning. Do you know there was never a time that Jesus did not exist because he was there at the beginning? David wrote in Psalm 90, From everlasting to everlasting thou art God. 
So there never was a time when Jesus didn't exist. At Christmas, he clothed himself with flesh, but he always existed. Now you and I have a beginning, and we have an end, but Jesus is eternal, and that's why he could go to the cross and die for our sins. That's why Jesus is called our Redeemer. He's infinite, he's eternal, he's unchanging. Now doesn't that stagger your mind to consider that? God is the great I am, out of which everything came and everything will end. God's not a piece of reality, God is reality. That's why we read in Acts chapter 17, in him we live and move and have our being. And here's what Jesus is going to say at the end of history. He who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without price from the fountain of the water of life. He who conquers shall have this heritage. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, the murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, liars, they shall be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You know, these are the most direct words in the Bible about everybody's omega, our, our, our end. At the end of our life, we're going to face Jesus. And on that day, Jesus is going to satisfy those who thirst for him with eternal life. So if you're thirsty for Jesus, at that last day, you're going to be quenched. Your thirst is going to be quenched because you're going to face Jesus face to face. We read in the Bible, in Jesus, the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God will be their God, and he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Now, is that true for everyone? As we read, no, it isn't true for everyone. The cowardly, unbelieving, vile, murderers, sexually immoral, those who practice magic, idolaters, liars, their future will be eternal lake of fire. And those are very, very frightening words for those who are not thirsty for God. If you're thirsty, Jesus is the fountain of life. But if you're not thirsty, you're going to face Jesus as a judge, and you'll find a lake burning with fire. That's what Scripture says. That's what our Scripture tells us this morning. Yet there are even Christians today who, don't want, who say, I don't believe in hell, even though the Bible is filled with warnings about hell, and nobody warned us more about hell than Jesus did. We think hell is too scary to talk about, too depressing to think about. And so we try to come up with alternatives to hell. We say, oh, why? well, we're all going to go to the same place in the by and by. But that's not what the Bible said. And other people say, well, all roads lead to God. That's not what Jesus said. He said, I'm the Alpha, the beginning and the end. Some say a good God would not let anyone perish with hell. Well, all you have to do is point out the scripture that I just read. It says otherwise. So at the end of our life, we're going to face either an eternal heaven or an eternal hell. And there's no other place. Those who are thirsty for God will find a heavenly quenching of your thirst. Uh, but verse 8 doesn't step back from the awful reality about uh, those who will face a lake of fire. It's called the second death. Uh, it's an eternal death, just as in heaven it's an eternal life. Now there are those who say, well, what about those people that don't know God? We don't know God. But Paul said to those scoffers in Athens, he's not far from uh, any one of us. So the gospel's never out of reach for the thirsty. But you can't be lukewarm about thirst. You're either thirsty or you're not thirsty. And our gospel met, uh, mission is to proclaim Christ so that people will be made thirsty. That Jesus is the fountain of life. If you're thirsty for God, go to Jesus. If you're not thirsty for God, 
then you'll face a, a fire. Because Jesus said he will redeem the thirsty. In verse 6, Jesus says to the thirsty, I'll give water without price from the fountain of the water of life. So you see, the very first characteristic of a Christian is to be thirsty for God. And the scripture is for the thirsty. And we read, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who is thirsty, come. Let him who desires the water of life without price, come. Jesus invites the thirsty, come and I will quench your thirst. We read, he who conquers shall have this heritage. I will be his God and he shall be my son. And if you read the book of Revelation, you see that word conquer over and over and over. There's many things in our life that we have to conquer. And the book of uh, Revelation talks about the victory of the saints conquering those things that need conquered in, in life. It's used about a dozen times for the saints that are facing persecution or heresy or error. Jesus said to the church at Smyrna, the suffering church, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who conquers shall not be hurt by the second death. So then they become to the second death again. He who conquers shall not be hurt by the second death. That second death is called the lake of fire. We're told, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So that's the battle that we're, that's been going on ever since history began. The struggle between those who thirst for God and those who thirst for anything else. If we thirst for God just as a deer thirsts for flowing streams, we're going to conquer that worldly thirst that demands all of our time and attention and take up our cross and follow Jesus who offers us to drink from the, from the fountain of life. And you know to do that you need to conquer. Conquer, conquer, conquer. It's, it says conquer our thirst for anything else but to be satisfied with Christ. It's no secret that for many people today uh, when you say, are you thirsty for Jesus? And he says, oh no, that's like castor oil. Jesus is like castor oil to me. Nobody's thirsty for castor oil. Uh, there's so, many, so much better things to be thirsty, thirsty for. I'll never, never forget the big outbreak a long, long time ago uh, when I was a teenager that um, they started the Pittsburgh Marathon. And they announced in, in church that they would be, the city of Pittsburgh asked they would close all the churches in the line of the marathon and they said well because the marathon is more important than going to church so if you're more thirsty for running than thirsty for running for Jesus uh, that's a, a warning it says the alternative to thirsting for God is to be cowardly and unbelieving and vile and murderous sexually immoral and sorcerous idolatry and lies that's what many people thirst for these things and the end of that thirst is to reach a lake of, of fire. That's what happens to those who do not thirst for God. But you might ask, well, how do we get people to be thirsty for God? And it all begins and it all ends with faith. Faith is looking to Christ and believing that he could quench your thirst. When a person crosses a desert and hears the word, words, to the thirsty, I will give water. Or let him who is thirsty come, and him who desires the water of life without price come. You have to come, or you'll, you, your thirst won't be um, being met. You have to come. Come to Christ, who's the fountain of life. And you're either going to come to Jesus at the end of life as a fountain or as a fire. We read in verse 7, He who conquers shall have this heritage. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So it's thirst that shows that you're God's children. And just as that thirst, Jesus told the parable about the prodigal son. And you notice, when the son realized he was in a pig pen, he got up and headed back to his father, repentant, wanting the lowest position. And what does the father do? He gives him a hug 
and a kiss and puts a ring on his finger, a robe on his back, and shoes on his feet. That's what Jesus said he's going to do to those who come to him. That's the omega for those who thirst in God. And look what happens after the thirst is quenched. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, nor any of the former things, for they have passed away. So the Alpha and the Omega is going to take away everything that makes us cry. It's in heaven, he's going to remove any depression, any anxiety, any guilt, and will be quenched with a never-ending joy that we never thirst for anything else again. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. At the beginning, he said, let there be light. And we're told at the end, he's going to be our light. We read in the prophet Isaiah, the sun shall no more be your light by day, nor brightness shall the moon give light to you by night, but the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor the moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of crying shall be ended. You know, at the end of every road is Jesus. We're going to meet him as water, we're going to meet him as fire. And we read to the thirsty, he'll give water without Christ from the fountain of the water of life. And then listen to the invitation of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit says, come, let him who hears come, and let him who is thirsty come. Let him who desires take the water of life without price. He could never earn it. He gives it for free. Remember, who is the beginning? Who is the end? Who was the beginning of our creation? Who will be our judge at, at the end? And remember the words to the thirsty. I will give water without price from the fountain of the water of life. That's called the gospel. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we give you thanks that your holy word reveals our beginning.